Okay, it's uh, 7.04 according to my cell phone right beside the computer. So I'll go ahead and uh, get started with this and uh, we'll, uh, we'll just keep on letting everybody in who uh, shows up a little bit later. Uh, I'm Bill Seacrest of the Heritage Center at uh, Fresno County Public Library. And uh, as you all know, we're here to uh, see uh, tonight's program on Fresno history, hiding in plain sight. Um, interestingly, this is the first Zoom, you're, you're making a little bit of history just by being here. This is the first Zoom program that uh, the, that the Heritage Center has ever hosted. And uh, we do have plans to uh, do more with what's left of this year. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, everybody gets no who's here tonight gets notified and uh, uh, stays in the loop for everything we uh, we do. And I'll have a very very shortly I'll have announcements on this. I was delayed a bit because of another program uh, uh, that revolves around doing some promotion for a, a very nice local history book that'll be coming out. And I wanted to make sure that all the signals were right so that. Uh, once the program was held, everybody who was interested would be able to get a hold of the book and that would all be explained. Well, we didn't have the timing uh, quite down on that yet, but now we do. So more announcements on programming will be coming. And uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, the way we'll work this is I'm going to... Uh, give this uh, over in just a couple minutes to our presenter. And uh, if you could uh, do me the favor of uh, putting your question, as, as uh, the program goes along, if you could go ahead and put your questions in chat and uh, let me uh, have them that way. When we finish, I'll go ahead and we'll read off and we'll get through as many of them as we can and uh, so that's how we'll, uh, we'll make that work. And it should be quieter and nicer uh, than having uh, people raise their hands uh, throughout. And uh, ho hopefully this will be a, a more efficient way of, of handling everything. So, uh, so there's that. And uh, then just to uh, give a short intro for... Uh, uh, tonight's program, Janine Raymond, who's with us and has very kindly agreed to uh, do this and very kindly agreed to come back after my first attempt at this program <laughs> flopped. But uh, once the technical details were settled, uh, she agreed to come back and uh, I'm very grateful to her for that. Uh, she's got a PhD in, from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, she's the uh, she's the historian for the Wilson Island neighborhood uh, here in town, which is uh, in the Fresno High School area, has many historic homes. She's documented them one by one, done a wonderful job with it. And her interest in local history topics hasn't stopped with that. She's done much else. And her additional researches are the product of uh, uh, well, what you see tonight are the product of her additional researches, some of which are uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I, I'm sure everybody will be interested in hearing more about them. Um, so that's a little bit about Janine and what she's going to do. And uh, I did want to slip in one other thing. Uh, for any of you who are wondering if this program is going to be uh, recorded, and put on the library's YouTube channel. Uh, indeed it will. Uh, don't quote me on the timetable, but we will get it up as fast as possible. So if anybody has, has missed it, would like to see it, uh, we'll have it available that way. So I'm done with my piece. And, and Janine, if you could go ahead and get everything started for us, I'd sure appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Bill, for that great introduction. Uh, I do have to make one correction, though. My degree is not from Berkeley, though I spent the last decade of my oh, professional I'm sorry. life here. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, it's actually in statistics and research methodology from USC. Oh, okay, very good. Okay, so um, I have this undying curiosity 
in Fresno history. And it comes from just paying attention to things around me and wondering, what, what is that? How did it get there? Um, what was it for? A lot of old structures and um, buildings have been repurposed. So I actually started over 30 years ago collecting information, but it wasn't until I retired about four years ago that I really had the time to start pulling it all together and synthesizing um, what I was finding. So one logistical note, my laptop is connected to a large screen. So I will be spending most of the time probably looking at the screen, managing slides. It doesn't mean I've forgotten you. It just means I'm really focused on um, seeing what you are seeing. So let's get started. Um, there are lots of clues about to Fresno's history that you can still see if you just take note of them. They're all around downtown and beyond. So I just, I picked four different things to look at tonight to hopefully um, inspire you to learn more and maybe explore on your own. So first um, we'll look at the 1870s and the placement of the Southern Pacific train depot and the courthouse and why those were important and what they reflect in our history. Then we'll look at the 20 year period from the 1870s to the um, 1890s and how the definition of downtown changed in that period as the, as the town grew. Then I'll take you to the 1920s and 30s and we'll visit three things, um, one building, an arch and a road uh, all played uh, important roles in the development of the town. And then finally, between 1913 and 1918, kind of the war, World War I years, we'll look at the Golden State Highway US 99 as it went through downtown Fresno. And we'll look at one building in particular that played a prominent role in that period. Okay. 1870s, there were two anchors to downtown Fresno that defined the downtown. And the first one was the Southern Pacific Railroad Depot built in 1872. This is not the original building. This, this is obviously a much larger footprint than the original building. Um, the railroad was actually called the Central Pacific Railroad at that time. And as you can see, there isn't much here. There's a whole lot of dirt and a hotel, a Fresno hotel, not the Fresno hotel that you know today. And that was pretty much it. The other anchor in that early period was the courthouse, the original courthouse built a dozen years later in Courthouse Park. Those two buildings for about a 20, 25 year period really define the nucleus of the town of Fresno. So I wanna take you to the first recorded map of Fresno and periodically I'm going to switch to a magnifier to help you if you're looking at a small screen. So this map, Fresno, town of Fresno, Fresno County was made by the Central Pacific Railroad. It was made, it was filed on 12th day of December, 1873 AD. At that time, there's the railroad depot, a couple of buildings immediately adjacent to it on H Street, just as it is today. And uh, blocks with, with lots marked on either side of that depot. So let's get out of this a minute. What's, what this implies then is the railroad owned this land. The railroad defined um, the streets, the layout of the streets. So the streets parallel to the tracks were lettered. The streets perpendicular to the tracks tended to be um, county names. And to plug in some street names that are more familiar to you today, J Street uh, has become Fulton. K Street is now Van S. And of course, you know Tulare, but Tulare and Van S define a specific corner. And those of you who know the downtown, 
are wondering why is the courthouse block way out there? I know it's here at Van Ness and Tulare. Well, it is, and it was relocated. So this is 1876. And now the courthouse has been moved. It's no longer out here on N. It's moved closer to the railroad tracks. It's centered on Mariposa, not Fresno. And one theory is the um, elites in Fresno at that time, the investors, the bankers, the businessmen, um, generally had their homes on J Street, maybe some degree to K, on K Street. And um, as the story goes, they wanted the courthouse closer to their homes, so they didn't have to walk so far. And maybe it was centered on Mariposa as a nod to the fact that when Fresno was first founded, it was in Mariposa County. Who knows? Anyway, it moved. And as you know, in, 18, in 1976, that old courthouse was demolished. It was not earthquake proof. Although I have heard um, secondhand from some who were present when that was demolished, that it really took more than an earthquake to pull it down. So today, what, what can you see today? Well, on the left is the train depot, the uh, Southern Pacific depot. The footprint is the same as it was then. And the modern courthouse, and, and I know this honeycomb structure had to be the pride of whatever architect designed it, um, clearly not a vintage design. So you have to be wondering why, why here? Why was Fresno, uh, why did it spring up here and who decided that? Um, who decided where Fresno would be today? It has to do with these four guys. These are um, sometimes referred to as the big four, the railroad tycoons. They included Mark Hopkins, Leland Stanford, Charles Crocker, and Collis Potter Huntington. They were capitalists with mansions on Knob Hill and San Francisco within blocks of each other. Mark Hopkins on the upper right uh, had his home built of wood and sadly he died shortly before it was finished and never did have an opportunity to live in it. It also burned down um, in the earthquake in 1906. Um, Huntington and Crocker had mansions right across the street from each other. And Leland Stanford bought an existing mansion actually and added on to it sometime during his tenure as either the governor of California or a senator, I'm not sure which. So today, the Huntington Mansion is no longer there. It's Huntington Park on Knob Hill. Mark Hopkins, I'm sure you've heard of the hotel if you haven't stayed in it. That's his legacy. Charles Crocker, the Grace Cathedral now stands on the block that his mansion um, used to occupy. And Leland Stanford is the only one whose home is still there. It's a um, historic park that I believe is open to the public. So, these four men were investors in not only railroads, but other businesses. Um, they refer to themselves as the associates with Stanford as the president, Huntington as a vice president, Crocker as a second vice president, and Mark Hopkins as a treasurer. So why, why were they interested in the Central Valley? Well, in 1869, their railroad had finally connected. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed. And I have to think that well before 1869, being the businessmen that they were, they were looking for other opportunities for their railroad. And in the Central Valley, or with eyes to the Central Valley, they had to know Isaac Friedlander. Friedlander was known as the Wheat King of California. He 
he didn't produce wheat. He invested in the production of wheat and the, and the sale and marketing of wheat. He was also a UC regent at one time and very involved in San Francisco politics. They probably knew William Chapman. William Chapman was the largest landowner in the state, if not the country. And when the US government acquired the land in the Central Valley in particular after the 1848 Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty where the US acquired land from Mexico, he was buying directly from the US government <clears throat> thousands of acres, thousands of acres. They may have known Moses Church. Moses was the founder of the Fresno Canal and Irrigation Company, which he started just a couple of years um, after the town was founded in 1872. Uh, his company was the predecessor of the Fresno Irrigation Company today. And they may have known of A.Y. Easterby. Easterby was um, part of what was called the German syndicate that was that bought about 80,000 acres of land from the U.S. Land Office. And uh, the way the syndicate worked, you signed up for a certain number of acres, and in his case, it was 5,000. So a friend of his, a fellow syndicate member, asked him, what are you going to do with 5,000 acres in the Central Valley? And his response was, well, I bought it for a buck and a half an acre. I think I'll probably sell it for five bucks an acre. And the response was, nobody wants that land. Now, you have to understand that Easterby lived in Napa and was probably imagining green rolling hills like he was seeing in Napa. So he then thought, well, you know, it might grow wheat. I don't know. And he connects with Moses Church. Uh, Moses was originally a, a sheep rancher, and he was having problems finding forage for his sheep. Easterby told him, hey, look, I've, I've got um, 5,000 acres down there in the Central Valley. Why don't you take your sheep down and they can graze down there? No thought that the Central Valley at that time was known as a desert with dry plains and sand dunes. So Easterby came to this area. He took 2,000 of 2,000 acres of his 5,000, and he started a wheat experiment in the area that is now um, Sunnyside. And that's why you have East Bay Elementary School out there. Um, he was impressed with Church, who he hired to bring water um, to his wheat experiment, as was this guy, Leland Stanford. Stanford was known to hop on his horse and ride down into the Central Valley looking for potential routes for other railroad lines for his, for his company. And when he saw Easterby's wheat and he saw what most church had done, tapping the Kings River and bringing water in, he allegedly declared, this is where a town will be. This is where a railroad depot will be. That was in 1871 and the following year, the depot was built. So the following year, a smaller version of this was put in place. Within a couple of years, Easterby was actually shipping wheat uh, on that railroad line. Immediately, the Central Pacific Railroad mapped the town and located the depot. They aligned the downtown streets with the tracks. And if you uh, would Google on any small town along the Central Pacific route today, and zero in on the downtown streets, you will see that the Central Pacific Railroad did exactly the same thing in every town. The, the downtown nucleus is aligned with the tracks. So here it is today. Um, some of you may even be familiar with the refurbished buildings that are on H Street. And this was the other, um, anchor downtown. So between those two structures, between the depot that was bringing in and taking out folks and produce, um, we also have three blocks away, the courthouse and courthouse park. Um, so I want to go back briefly to this very first map, even the, the courthouse, uh, the block that was designated for the courthouse is in a different spot. But the point here is 
the definition of downtown in the 1870s was immediately around the railroad tracks <clears throat> and not much further. And here's what it looked like when the courthouse was built. Um, these are wooden structures, so they're long gone today. All the roads were dirt, obviously. And if you look out, kind of not quite at the horizon, you can see the, a little bit of agricultural development um, popping up, but lots of open space, lots of open space in, this is now 14 years after the town was first located by Leland Stanford. So let's go forward in time. This is 1898. This is a Sanborn map, and Sanborn Company sent their surveyors to towns um, that were very meticulously recorded, and it was for the purpose of ensuring buildings. So each one of these numbers refers to a page that has far more detail about the buildings um, in that specific area. Um, it's what it's made of, what its power sources were. But the, the reason I'm showing you this here is in 1898, we now, we still have this Southern Pacific Railroad and we now have a spur called the Parallel Branch. And today, if you drive over in that part of town, there is a street called Parallel Street or Avenue. The Santa Fe Railroad has appeared um, and the town was delighted when that occurred because the focus of the Southern Pacific Railroad was to move produce and commercial activity in and out of Fresno, in and out of the valley, actually. They, they declared Fresno the hub of their activity. Santa Fe was more focused on the people, the passengers. Um, so what's happening in 1898 is the town is now beginning to expand beyond the space that was defined by those railroad tracks. So now the, the nucleus of the town, the definition of downtown has shifted away from the railroad tracks and now is more around Courthouse Park. And it's starting to move north, a little bit to the east, not much on the south. We're gonna talk about these areas later and then a little bit to the west. So streets that you're probably familiar with, Divisadero, is the street that where the, the orientation of the streets changes. And you'll learn about that in a few minutes. Um, Tulare marked the edge of the business district. The surveyor was marking in this in, encircled red area, the basic business district of downtown where all the, those big tall buildings were and many still are. Um, and Ventura was pretty much the Southern edge of town. Um, there are two things we're going on beyond that, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, let's fast forward to 1930. And what I want you to notice first is just the concentration of blue lines. Um, there's a uh, concentration of them right in the center. There's a bit that's moved to the north, a little bit more that's northeast, not much going on to the south and even less to the west of town. This map was made by the Chamber of Commerce. And in its center, let's see. So in the center right here is the courthouse. So this is now, what, almost 60 years after the founding of the town and downtown, the nucleus of downtown is still defined as Courthouse Park. Within, let's see, within a one mile radius, so this circle right here, um, Belmont Avenue is at the top of that. California is at the bottom. And that's pretty much what we saw in 1898. So that was the first, you know, what, 25 years of Fresno just a one mile of a town um, concentrated around the streets that the railroad had defined. 
two mile radius. Ends at McKinley on the north, and I believe this is Jensen on the south. So from McKinley to Jensen, in that two mile radius, we have Roding Park. We have on the east side, the county hospital and the footprint for Roosevelt. On the west side is Chandler Airfield. So you have to imagine that, that at the time the airfield was built and the county hospital was located, um, that, that felt like it was a long ways out of town. The three mile radius, Shields Avenue. So in 1930, there is not much going on beyond Shields Avenue. To the west are the cemeteries, which have actually been there for a while. Um, there's Fresno High, Fresno Normal School, the fairgrounds wow. over here to the east. Uh, the, the fairgrounds have actually been there since the 1880s. So at the time they were built, they, they were considered way out there in the boonies. And there was actually an orphanage in the 1800s between the center of town and that and the fairgrounds. So the Chamber of Commerce tells us that by 1930, there were a little over 52,000 people in Fresno. Um, Chandler Airport is receiving mail as well as passengers. And lots of hotels, 22 hotels and theaters and several natatoriums. Uh, and we're gonna, toward the end, we'll come back to what a natatorium was and what they did at one in particular. And then a point of interest among Big Garden, Fresno State, high schools, et cetera, was the America's, was America's largest sugar pine lumber mill at Pinedale. I wanna come back to this map for a minute because it, it um, there's something else going on here that, that is not obvious. The expansion to the north was primarily residential expansion. It was the middle class of Fresno with some exceptions. The Armenian community was down here below Tulare, as was the industrial part of town. The Volga Germans were at about California and Elm. The Italian community was somewhat adjacent to them. And of course, Chinatown was right in back of the railroad tracks and had been since the 1870s. So what, what you have in the, in the definition of the town, if you will, around the turn of the 20th century is a nucleus downtown that is, that is moving north, but it's the um, European middle class that is not the working class. The working class and the ethnic communities were like a collar around the downtown area. That uh, to some degree, um, there are, there's evidence of those today. Certainly on M Street, there's a lot to see um, that's vestiges of that Armenian community. The um, church, the Volga German church is still there. It doesn't belong to them anymore, but it's, it's still there. Chinatown, of course, and I understand there are, there's research being done now um, on the Italian part of town. So again, railroads ever present, um, defining um, the downtown of Fresno. So today, Divisadero marks the junction between the grid, the downtown grid that was laid out by the railroad in 1873, and the requirements of the land ordinance, a federal ordinance in, from 1785, it required uh, land to be surveyed um, using 
cardinal north, south, east, and west. Now, I understand that uh, every state west of the Mississippi does conform to this land ordinance, except Texas. <clears throat> so, what can we see today? Well, at the train station, as you drive by that or walk into it on H Street, know that you are walking on the land that Leland Stanford walked on, or perhaps rode his horse on, when he decided this is where it'll be. So that train station is the beginning of Fresno, 1872. Um, you can see the place that the original courthouse occupied, pictured down there on the lower right, that for at least 25 years, maybe longer marked, the geographic center of town, the nucleus of Fresno. You can see obviously the configuration of the downtown streets. And remember that that alignment was with the tracks. The Central Pacific Railroad owned the land and they called the shots. And that map, that Central Pacific map really prevailed and contained the growth well into the 1890s. And again, uh, remember that Divisadero marks that transition if you're moving out of, out of the downtown area from the railroad grid to the north, south, east, west streets that were required by the federal government. Okay, so let's go on to some structures that are still visible today. There's one, one that's kind of fun to look at. It's, it's called the Stage Depot. It was built in 1920. And you're probably thinking or asking, how in the world can Fresno be uh, make room for horse-drawn stagecoaches in 1920? Well, it wasn't. A stage in that era was a multi-passenger vehicle that's really more a predecessor of today's buses. So this is the Rustigian building uh, built in 1920. It's at the corner of Fulton and Mono. Um, I want to draw your attention to this um, bay door um, on Mono and the arched entrances, main entrance on the front on Fulton. We're going to come back to those in a minute. This is 1925. Uh, it was a big splash in the Fresno Morning Republican in November. And by then, the building, the Rustigian building, was leased by the California Transit Company. And they announced that the white stages were going out of use. And if I go back to this, it's these vehicles that are lined up uh, on Mono. Those are the white stages being replaced. The newer types inside being loaded up in this photo uh, are much more substantial vehicles, but the latest, the, the latest, greatest long distance model with reclining seats is this one pictured in, on the right. It has extra wheel in front. It's got double wheels in the back. It's got a much more substantial luggage rack. And just in case people forgot what it was like to travel in those multi-passenger vehicles in 1916, they've included a photo at the bottom here of one of the original stages with the canvas roll down sides and bench seatings that obviously didn't recline and a box in the back seat to put whatever it was you were taking with you. The rusty in building, the stage depot. You could get anywhere in the valley on one of these stages. So on the left, this map in the anchor stage line ad shows you can get from Bakersfield all the way up to um, San Jose, certainly past Modesto. You could get into the foothills and over to the coast. In the center, it shows you if you went on the Santa Cruz line, uh, what stops it made. In between, Huntington Lake must have been a popular stage. It had two departure times, 7.30 in the morning and three in the afternoon with a lot of stops in between. Colica, another popular, popular route with two departure times. 
So basically, as the ad on the right suggests, anytime you want to go anywhere, come to the Stage Depot. We're ready. This is that building today. The Rustigian building, <clears throat> 1920. Here are those three main entrances now no longer used as a main entrance. In the photo in the lower left, um, that bay door is still there, still preserved. And in the upper right, the volume of traffic, uh, number of customers back in the day was so um, large that it uh, required, or at least they, um, they decided to add a restaurant right next to the Stage Depot. It was a thriving restaurant. I want to um, point out something else while we're here. I want to go to the top of this building. If you drive around any of these streets um, in this part of Fresno, in the southern part of town, you'll see at the top the name of the person that had the building constructed. And above that, or sometimes below it, you'll see a number. And that's not the address. That's the date it was built, 1920 in this case, J.M. Restigian building. Across the street, built in 1919, was Iman's hardware store. Probably not a surprise that the hardware store was right across the street from the business that probably had to do some automotive repairs. Uh, up until very recently, it was uh, Zach's, the facade was changed quite a bit. It, it does not look much like it did before. It was turned into um, a brewing company. Many of these buildings downtown are beginning to be repurposed um, in the brewing district. And I just learned this week that Zach's is no longer Zach's. It was actually purchased by this young woman who is going to be turning it into a grumpy burger lady. Um, supposed to open in, in a month or so. So this part of town is the place to be. And the Rustigian building, I also learned recently, is now the modernist, a craft cocktail bar located in the brewery district. Okay, let me just uh, give you a reminder I have a few seconds. If you have any questions or comments about anything that I've covered so far, then the maps, the beginning, um, the stage depot, any of that, be sure to send them into the chat room and we'll pick them up at the end. Okay. Um, within 30 years, from 1886 to 1916, Fresno changed dramatically. It went from this to this. So it's obviously filled in quite a bit. There's, there's no space between these big buildings. Um, the courthouse, the water tower, the Helm building, one of the earlier multi-story buildings. These um, buildings with the conical turrets were bank buildings actually. So it is. It has become far denser, and it's moved quite a ways away from things like this. This was the first water tower in Fresno, uh, built according to this report when Fresno was a village, and when you could ride your horse right up to the bar or the saloon. Um, this was the status of the village when the water tower furnished water for the city. This was disappearing within that 30 year period. What's arriving are not only the buildings, but if you notice kind of in the air above the street, electric cars are also arriving. Okay, so let's move on um, to the Van Ness Arch. It was actually built twice. Most recently is, and the one that you see today, is the 1929 version. It's located at the foot of, M of Van Ness, uh, 
where right at the railroad tracks, you can see a little bit of that on the left here. Any, any of you who might be artists might know Chris Sorensen's studio on the right, um, a flourishing and thriving studio. Uh, this arch, built in 1929, was actually refurbished by the Caglia family in the 1980s, and they are the ones that added the best little city in the USA. But this is what it originally looked like. Built in 1917, it burned in 1925 and was replaced. It was the entrance to Fresno on the south end of town. Obviously a dirt road that accommodated both um, vehicles and foot traffic. A lot of open space around it, which obviously is not there today. Um, when I find photos like this, I not only look the foreground, but I love looking in the background to see what I can see. And I notice there's, there's this big building, 1917. Um, it's operating, so it had to be built before 1917. That's really early for such a building. But you know what? I think I think I know that building. So you can't read it very well in this blow up, but it says People's Ice Company um, on the on the upper rim here. And there was a People's Ice Company in Fresno that delivered ice by horse and wagon um, to the city. Uh, well, that building is still there. And if you are down on Cherry Street, 1844 South Cherry to be exact, you will see the former People's Ice Company, which is now a self-storage building. And the reason I know that building is because uh, my husband has a collection of um, books, uh, vintage books that need to be stored in a um, temperature controlled environment. So one summer we went looking at options in Fresno and on one of those days when it was over a hundred we happened to be in this building and it is it, it has amazing temperature control for obvious reasons which we didn't know at the time. It was a nice company. Okay so that arch was significant uh, in its day. If you were coming from Los Angeles over the ridge route down the grapevine into Bakersfield and on to Fresno. It was a, a pretty challenging excursion. If you had problems on the road, you were on your own. There were no gas stations along the way. There was no health along the way. And much of it was dirt roads paved in places. So when you got to this arch in Fresno, that you, you made it to hotels, safety, repairs if you needed them. Um, it was the official entrance of US 99 into Fresno. So this map, 1930, uh, is specifically a map showing old 99 going through Fresno before there were any bypasses. That arch is right here at the southern entrance. Um, so, you know, if there's something on the south, there must have been something on the north. Well, there was, but not quite as early as the entrance on the south. And that thing on the north was called the Belmont Subway. Some call it now the Belmont Tunnel. So here it is, right here, going under the tracks. And what happened was up until 1932, Belmont, the street and the tracks were at the same grade level. So pedestrians, kids on bicycles, the occasional auto, they were just clunkety clunk clunking right over those railroad tracks. And it became a bit dicey. Um, so the city, the county and the Southern Pacific Railroad joint forces collaborated in putting the street under the tracks. Um, if you were coming from downtown, you coming, you went through that arch and you came all the way through downtown Fresno. So you're coming up on H Street to Belmont. Um, you'd make a left, go under the tunnel. If you were coming from San Francisco, you would come down 
Golden State Highway or Golden State Boulevard, which is still there. You can still find it today. Um, you come to this traffic circle and go around the circle and shoot out on Belmont, catch H and head downtown. You went by Roydy Park in the process and the entrance to the zoo is right there off the circle. And if any of you have been to the zoo, I know you've been close to or on that, that circle. That traffic circle was eligible for the local historic register because it was the first one on the west coast of its kind. And, and that is reflected in the reactions to that circle. So it was a big deal on opening day. There was a ribbon cutting. And pretty soon, we got feedback like this. This is a letter to the editor of the Fresno Bee and Morning Republican. I was speeding south from San Francisco to Bakersfield, marveling at the broad, straight highway, when suddenly, as I approached Fresno, my senses were quickened by crisscrosses Warnings, arrows as the highway suddenly turned to the right and simultaneously to the left and kept on turning until I was facing the direction from which I had come. So I stopped to investigate. Or this other person, traveler, who concluded, you know, I think the same guy who cluttered up our north entrance um, with the, the park circle, they're not capable of designing the southern entrance. So in short, that circle was a bit confusing. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it survived until today, until uh, soon it will be gone. So approaching, approaching it from the west, the traffic circle is now behind you. You can see the rusty railroad tracks. There's a what was probably a beautiful Southern Pacific medallion in the center of that overpass. Uh, path for pedestrians separate from vehicles. If you were coming up H Street from downtown, uh, now there's a signal at Belmont that you come up H and turn left to go to enter that subway. And if you're really observant, if you get up to your car and walk over to that spot, right, that, that spot right here that the arrow is pointing to, you'll see this brass plaque. Um, commemorating the joint efforts and mentioning all the people who were involved in making it happen. And at the very end, it mentions Thompson Construction Company general contractors. The Thompson brothers were a major construction operation in Fresno in this period. They, it, most of our roads and sidewalks are attributed to their company. They also provided the um, gravel and uh, I guess bedrock that is under all the big buildings down, downtown, including the Security Pacific building. If you're walking around in any of the old neighborhoods, you may see one of these stamps of theirs in the sidewalk at the interse intersection. But you have to be really observant to find this one. So right next to that black um, bronze plaque is the old painted US 99 signage. And I parked, walked, looked at the um, west side entrance and I can't find the same thing. So I don't know if it's was never there or I just wasn't looking hard enough, um, but both signs were there. And if you happen to be approaching that subway from Belmont, just driving straight through um, that spot on your right is where you would look for both the brass plaque and the painted US 99 sign. Okay, but if you want to see the Belmont Circle and the Belmont subway, you have to do it pretty soon because it's going to be demolished. It's in the path of the high-speed rail. There's a great article about that um, by George Hostetter, um, published in June of 2019. If you Google on SanWalkingValleySun.com, I'm sure you'll find it or his name. 
And if you're interested in the history of Highway 99 as it went through Fresno, there's a great and very thorough article by Challenger Tom, written in or published in 2017 at um, ribblenation.org. I'm sure if you Google on his name, Challenger Tom, you might find that article. Both of them are interesting reads. But again, um, if you want to see if you're unfamiliar with that tunnel, underpass, subway, and the traffic circle, you need to see them soon because they'll be gone when the high speed rail comes through. Okay, so what can you see today? You could see the Rustigian building, the old anchor stage depot, and notice that it is just one block off of old Highway 99. You can see the Van Ness Arch, the official entrance, southern entrance, or if you're coming from the north, the official exit. And I'm guessing since the arch was built, first in 1917 and the subway was not built until 1932 that that suggests that there might have been more traffic no more northbound traffic from LA than there was southbound traffic from San Francisco but that's speculation on my part um, and of course the subway and the traffic circle marking the northern entrance and if you um, drive those streets Bell uh, Broadway H Street a little bit over to, to Van Ness, know that you are driving the old Golden State Highway route, US 99 route, before there were ever bypasses. And here is that complex of streets, just as a reminder, going right through that nucleus of downtown. And you could find hotels there, you could find shopping there, food there that was the place to be so this natatorium well what's that about built in 1918 and why is that relevant to this story well it was on broadway it was on i street sometimes written as i the letter i sometimes i like your eyeball i but broadway was i street you may know it as the Rainbow Ballroom. And it was, at the time it was built, it was on the main drag through Fresno. It was magnificent. It was built at a cost of almost a million dollars in today's dollars. It had a beautiful glass facade for natural lighting, window boxes, arched entries in the fine print, Underneath this drawing, in its completion, the city is to have a bathhouse that's second to none in the entire state. With the conveniences planned, the building is intended to become an all-year pleasure center. It was a huge indoor competitive pool with seating on a mezzanine level, and it attracted major, major competitive races. So here's one from 1918, summer, July, championship, championship races featuring Olga Dorfner and Gertrude Artell, world's record holders. Well, so my curiosity kicks in and I'm wondering who are Olga and Gertrude? And the first thing I find is 10 days earlier, they'd actually competed against each other in Oakland. Uh, where Olga um, set another record, American, uh, new American record in swimming, 100 yards. And Gertrude Artelt, it says, of Philadelphia finished second. So it kind of implies there's a circuit of some sort, and Fresno is clearly on that circuit. And this natatorium was where it all happened. This was a big deal in the World War I years. So I had to find out more about Olga and Gertrude. And I started with Olga, who was in fact a competitive swimmer her entire life, or um, most of it. 
1918, she was the first American woman to break a swimming world record. And in 1970, was inducted to the International Hall of Fame. Gertrude, however, had a slightly different um, trajectory. Among 2,000 swimmers, she's selected as the perfect American woman. She does have a stellar swimming career. Um, but after uh, that career ended fairly early, she moved into health and beauty and um, connected her swimming experiences with a health and beauty byline. She met a sad end. She died relatively young and at about age 47. Um, she was actually murdered by her husband who then committed suicide. So two women with very different career paths right here in Fresno of national fame. But the natatorium became the Rainbow Ballroom and had a succession of um, performances. Gone was that beautiful queer story on um, the window facade and the window boxes. Um, very much changed. And I learned just a month, a couple months ago, the building's for sale. So if you have a spare four million, you two could own one of the um, most spectacular Fresno old buildings, requiring quite a bit of refurbishing. Okay, so I, I want to leave you with um, some options for experiencing downtown Fresno yourself, if you're up to exploring a bit. And one of those options is the business district. Um, if you drive south on Fulton and cross the Visadero, remember the streets get kind of funky after the Visadero, and notice the tall buildings from the 1920s along Fulton. Um, you could visit the train depot, the, the Southern Pacific train depot on H Street, circle the, cur the courthouse. You could drive south, move over to Van Ness, find the arch. And if you're up for exploring a little bit more, keep driving past the arch. You can drive on Old Highway 99 to Kingsburg. And there's a lot to see uh, on that on that route, including some pretty big old brick warehouse buildings that are still operating. So as you go down Fulton, find the Bank of Italy, which incidentally is also being refurbished. But I want you to notice the little building three doors up from it. That little building being restored is the oldest building in Fresno. It's, it housed Fresno's first newspaper, the Fresno Daily Expositor. The building was built in 1881. It's right on Fulton, 1029 Fulton. The second story was added in 1888. It housed um, editorial offices upstairs and the presses were downstairs. When, it, when that newspaper folded, which was in about 1898, I believe, um, it was a saloon on the first floor and a lodge hall on the second. That's the Expositor Building, oldest building in Fresno, three doors north of the Bank of Italy. You might notice the Pacific Southwest Building, the tallest building on our skyline, built in 1923, also on Fulton, 1060 Fulton. The bank president at the time told the architect, Richard Felchlin, I want to give Fresno a banking home that architecturally would be surpassed by no other bank on the Pacific coast. I want a landmark that adds to the beauty of the skyline. And to achieve that, he sent Felchlin and his team to New York to see what do buildings look like there? We know there's big ones there. Let's see what they look like. So. These are some of the buildings that in 1923 were indeed in New York City when Felchman and his team went to check them out. And I think it's no surprise then that when he came back to Fresno, he designed something that was very similar in many ways 
to what he saw in New York. And at the time it was constructed in 1923, it was the tallest building between Oakland and Los Angeles. That building was constructed at a cost of what would be equivalent to $18 million today. In the design phase, Felch and his team worked for five years before they ever began construction. The studies and the sketches alone took two men, two solid months to complete. And when he, after it was opened, when he finished, Felchland uh, reported that it might take three months to close out all the books, you know, figure out, figure out how much that building really cost. In fact, it took him six months. And at the end of that time, he and his wife, Dorothy, took off for the Orient for a long vacation. Another, a second option you have, if you want to experience old Highway 99 as it went through downtown, is to start on Golden State Boulevard anywhere north of Belmont. I mean, you could start at Herndon and drive south into that traffic circle and then exit through the Belmont subway. See if you can find those old signs, the brass sign and the painted, faded paint US 99 sign. Turn right onto H Street and head downtown, slip over to Broadway, see if you can find the Rainbow Ballroom on Broadway, see if it's sold yet. Um, find the old Anchorage or Anchor Stage Depot, the now the modernist on Fulton. And remember, you're one block off of old Highway 99 at that point. Drive around the industrial part of town a little bit. That's There are fascinating structures down there. So, you would go under the, uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks coming off of the circle. You'd be looking for these signs, the brass sign and the painted 99. And you might notice once you're on H Street, not very far down H Street, this building. This is the Benham Ice Cream Company building built in 1912. 1420 H Street. Benham was the largest producer of ice cream in California. And this building housed their offices, their production line, and storage. Then in 1937, it was sold to Dale Brothers Coffee Company for production and storage. And they're the ones that put that little top lot on there. Um, the architect was Richard Felchland. This is um, one of his first commissions when he came to Fresno. He, he was actually a, a UC Berkeley grad, had been in San Francisco at the time or shortly after the earthquake. So he, he was familiar with um, new opportunities or he saw what you, could be, what you could do with brand new structures and inventing um, architectural statements. He was extremely successful in Fresno and did a lot of other buildings. Then if you continue on H Street or Broadway uh, past 180, and in this upper right corner um, photo, you can see a little snippet of 180 there, continue south and the street is lined with old brick shops pretty much all automotive shops, machine shops, things that, that would have attracted business from people entering that arch in 1917, that Van Arch needing some kind of help with their vehicle. And if, if you'll notice, let's see if I can get a, yeah, something that helps here. <clears throat> on these buildings that have a peaked roof and a clear story, um, that's the tip off that is probably a building from the 1800s. These buildings needed natural light inside. They were, they were big uh, machine areas inside. They didn't have electricity in those shops. They had natural lighting in those shops. You might notice this building. This is at the foot of M Street. It's the Fresno Brewing Company, built in 1907. 
and it's being lovingly restored by its current owner um, who found the original signs in the building um, after he purchased it and just recently had those redone and mounted on the facade office building and the side bottling house. Um, this building did not actually produce the beer, but this one did. This is the production building that was right next to, just if you can imagine these two buildings right across the street from each other. Um, there was a pipe, there were underground pipes that sent the beer from this tall production building over to the bottling building next door, the one that you can still see today. When this building was demolished, the bricks were used for other construction in Fresno. Or you might visit, you might drive around on Cherry Street and find that old People's Ice Company. And if you need any storage temperature control, that's your building. Okay, I'd like to leave you with some resources for those who want to explore some more on their own. Um, the Heritage Center at the Downtown Library is a fantastic resource and the staff there are wonderful. Um, helping you find find things and research topics. There's the Fresno Historical Society, a little harder to get to their resources, but still a good repository. Um, there's one article in particular that, that I found fascinating, and it was written by an unlikely source, um, about water and the rise of public ownership in Fresno on the plain from 1858 to 1878. It was written by Todd Shallot, who worked for the Fresno Department of Public Works in 1978, and it's uh, just a fascinating resource and replete with not just facts and data and tables, but also some photos and drawings. And then there's a plethora of online archives. So um, Online Archives of California is one that's a very good resource. Um, if, if you're interested in learning more about Fresno history, I'm doing two sessions at Fresno State in the Osher or OLLI program, where I'll be focusing on the people of early Fresno. That's the end of April and beginning of May. And you can always reach me at my website. Um, if you have any questions after today or any comments or feedback, please um, feel free to um, contact me through that website. So with that, um, Bill or Amina, do we have yeah, any I, questions? I, I... Yes, I'm here. And uh, again, Janine, thank you so much. Uh, your presentation is proof that uh, by taking the time to follow the trails and the byways, when you're researching major historical subjects, you often, you, you, you find so many details. And uh, just like when you were talking about the, the swimmers uh, who came down here and were at the natatorium, uh, you, through these investigations, we find out how connected Fresno was to the outside world and uh, how uh, in turn we, we had important noteworthy things going on over here uh, for, uh, for, for really all, all of our history. And it starts, of course, with the Big Four and uh, the Southern Pacific deciding to uh, build the route through Fresno in the first place and uh, then the whole proposition just keeps on going from there. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I've got someone raising their hand, and if you could, if you could go ahead and just put your question in the chat box, we'll we'll get to it. We've got a number of things uh, saved up here, and I'll start to uh, work my way through them. And by all means, if anybody has some additions as we go along. Uh, feel free. Uh, first question is from Francine and Murray, and uh, it's, what was the charge for writing on those stages? Oh, yeah, that's an excellent <laughs> question. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know. But if I had to go by the, uh, by any other comparison, a ticket into that natatorium for an adult was 25 cents. And that was about the same era. So I don't know, extrapolate from there. I, I don't know. 
The, the one thing that I would add is that since I have gone through many miles of newspaper microfilm, I can tell you that the Fresno Republican newspaper had an automotive section for a long time. And uh, when you look in the, when you look in the back pages of that section, uh, you can often see uh, the stage companies and the rates. Uh, that, so that's one other way to get into it. At, at this time, when the library is closed, if, uh, if any of you have access to newspapers.com, they have the Fresno uh, Morning Republican file, and you can get to it that way. Uh, while their subscription prices are nominal, if, uh, if I'm remembering this right, you can do like a week-long trial with them. And if you're just interested in looking up uh, the rates, they some of them anyway would probably be there. Uh, next question is from Matt, and he says, where did you find the maps? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I have friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I also do a lot of sleuthing. So let's see. Um, some of them I found actually at the Heritage Room. Um, the Sanborn maps are in our personal collection. Um, what else did I have up there? Oh, oh. Um, and the other maps were shared with me by contacts that I have in the county surveyor's office. Very good. Uh, I, I just add to that real quick, the Sanborn maps, which are color coded and beautifully done and available for Fresno for a number of years uh, from 1885 to 1950. Uh, if you go, if anyone who's interested uh, wants to Google Library Congress Sanborn maps, that will lead you to uh, the page where the Library of Congress has mounted many of these things uh in digital format and you can blow them up on your home computer look at them but it, uh, it doesn't cost a nickel and it's yeah. very fascinating stuff yeah uh sherry uh and i think this already was covered uh that she remarked that you mentioned the traffic circle being eliminated and yes in favor of uh high-speed rail yes yeah, the, it's right in the path of high-speed rail. And I just drove by it uh, a couple days ago. Um, there's, there's nothing immediately near it right now that looks like it's threatening the destruction of it. But in the underpass itself, one of the lanes is blocked off. I have no idea what they're doing. Um, I, don't, I don't know how soon it would be demolished. Yeah, well, the, you know, the timetable is so variable on that to yeah. begin with. I yeah. think it'd be hard for anyone to estimate. Uh, w, and I'll answer this one real fast, asks, I saw this presentation was recorded. Will it be available? Uh, I, I explained this earlier, but for the benefit of anybody else who tuned in late, uh, yes, uh, it'll be on, once we do a tiny bit of editing, it'll be available on the library's uh, YouTube channel. So uh, you can, uh, if, if you want to, if you want to see it again, uh, that'll be the way to get a hold of it. And then uh, let's see. Jean asks, what do you know about the garden court building? I work for the company that owns it and work in it. And I've learned quite a bit about it. It's a fascinating building and I would love to know more. The garden court building? Uh, I'm not familiar with that one. What street is it on? Uh, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's relatively close to uh, the Warner's Theater at Tuolumne and uh, oh, and, and Fulton. Fulton. No, and just to, yeah, and just a little ways north of that. That I'm just guessing that might be the one that was originally designed. Fresno has three buildings designed by Julia Morgan. That might be one of them. Uh, okay, well, thank you for asking that question and I will do a little bit of research on that. Thank you. And then uh, let's see. 
Sheng asks, I heard there are tunnels underground in downtown Fresno. Are they still there? If so, what year were they constructed and what were they constructed for? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, it lets me tell you a fun, very brief story. I was interviewing two descendants of the Volga Germans. The Volga German community was very close to uh, Chinatown. And so the kids all went to school together. And in this interview, I made the comment, you know, I've heard about tunnels um, in that part of town. Did they really exist? I've, hear, I've heard pros and cons. And, and the woman very emphatically said, absolutely there are tunnels because I have played in them. After school, the kids would all go to the tunnels and play in these underground fantasy places. So yes, they, there were tunnels. Are they still there? I don't know the current status of them. Uh, the, the bee did run an article or two on that subject. And uh, Shang, if you would be kind enough to drop a note to uh, the Heritage Center, you just go to uh, our uh, web page on the library site. There's a on our uh, on the Heritage Center main page. There's a button that you can press to drop us a email. Uh, I'll be happy to send those uh, articles about the tunnels to you, and uh, that'll give you a little more information. And then Jean followed up and said that the Garden Court building is at Tuolumne and L, which sounds about right to me. I'm just trying to, I, I, I know that's close to where the Julia Morgan building is. And uh, that's, uh, that's one. And Janine, if uh, okay. it, it, I was going to say, if you could check up on that and then get back to me and then, yeah. and then Jean, again, if you want to email the Heritage Center, uh, we'll we'll get to the bottom of that one and uh, find out what we can for you. Uh, then Ray asks, is Fresno Station open to the public? I read that there used to be a park in front where the Fresno Commerce, I, I think that's, or I, I think uh, you mean Fresno Chamber of Commerce building used to be. Or did he say Chamber of Commerce or Fresno Station like the train station? I think he means the Chamber of Commerce building, which was right in the railroad reservation. Um, so I did not go in the building because the gates were locked. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And the one thing that I do know is the Chamber of, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce building was right in that area. It's, uh, it's very, you know, it was a very interesting little structure. Uh, of course, Chamber of Commerce is still in uh, Fresno's downtown, but they have moved over. They've been on Fresno Street for many years. Uh, but the old Chamber of Commerce building was laid out as kind of an advertisement for the the build for the county, and they would have all these displays of uh, fruits and. Uh, and nuts and other things that were grown here, uh, you know, major, major league uh, prize winning vegetables, that sort of thing. were all in the, uh, we're all in the chamber of commerce. And uh, again, uh, Ray, if you're interested in that, I, uh, I know we've got a couple of postcards of the chamber of commerce building and uh, I can, uh, I, I know it's possible to, uh, locate that uh, in, in a little more definite way. So uh, if you want to drop us an email on that, uh, we'll be happy to take a look. Okay. And I think that's the, the extent of our questions tonight. Okay. Unless I'll, I'll, I'll make a fast last call in case anybody uh, has something else they'd like to add to that. But, okay, uh, while you're doing that, I just want to thank um, everybody who tuned in today. It's, I really wish I could see your faces. That's the only thing that would make it better. Um, but I hope that it, this has left you with some new information about your town, our town, and a bit of its history, and also motivated you to explore a little bit on your own. And thank you, Bill. 
Well, thank you, Janine. I, I, you know, I uh, am impressed with uh, this from every possible angle, and I appreciate the time and effort it took to pull this together for everybody's entertainment. And uh, I'll, I'll just add that if there is anything uh, that, uh, that uh, people in the audience want to ask the Heritage Center directly about, we're, we're here to do specifically that. We're always happy to do it. And uh, then, uh, and if you, uh, if you reach us through email, we will always manage to get back to you. Uh, I did see one last question about the water tower is iconic. How does it factor in? And uh, if you, if, uh, if the person could maybe add a little more uh, background to that, we sure. could, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah there, we could there's... maybe ha hazard a hazard an answer uh, slash guess. Yeah, no, it was built in 1894. Uh, it's it, it's actually a piece that I've covered in a in another lecture. Um, so it was originally designed to have a library on the second floor, which never happened. Um, it is on the site of the um, the water steam plant that Moses Church connected the canal to. So let let me back up a minute. There was. Moses Church built a canal uh, tapping the Kings River to bring water into Fresno and that canal went right down Fresno Street. And there was a spur off of that canal to the location of the current water tower and the water tower was built right next to the steam production plant. And I, I have photos of that in a, in a different episode of Chronicles of Fresno, but um, it is. It looks pretty much today as it looked when it was designed in 1894. And I think we can all be thankful for that. It's one of Fresno's uh, true enduring landmarks. Yeah. Okay. So I, I I think we have gotten to the end of the question list. Okay. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming in tonight to... Uh, to participate in our inaugural local history night program. Uh, just to add real fast, we, uh, we will be having more of these. We'll get them announced through social media and uh, other outlets. And uh, I, uh, I thankfully am now developing a list of people uh, who I can uh, send uh, registration messages to. So, uh, there will be a couple of forthcoming announcements for the next local history nights. I will, uh, I will have the details out on those shortly. Uh, I can assure you all they'll be in, they'll, they'll be intriguing, fascinating, uh, well, well-researched, well-presented programs. And uh, I've been, uh, I've been very gratified by the response that we've uh, had over this and it proves that uh, there's been a longstanding need uh, for the library to get back into uh, programming. And uh, believe me, we will do our level best to keep these things coming for you. And uh, as always, we hope that uh, you'll stop by and uh, participate and uh, enjoy them. And uh, we'll, we'll make them just as good as we can. So with that, uh, we have reached the 8.28 uh, time, which is two minutes uh, ahead of schedule, everything's proceeded uh, very well. Thank you again for being a great audience. Thank you again, Janine, and thank you, uh, Mina, for uh, being my uh, co-host who kindly admitted people into the room while I was busy with other technical things. Thank you all so much, and we will see you soon at Local History Night.